morning, church. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to Harmony this morning, whether you're here in the room or watching online. Good to have you with us. Uh, just a, a few announcements for you as we begin the service today. Uh, first of all, it's good to have our junior high students back from their retreat last week uh, up in Muskoka Woods. They had a wonderful time, although I hear it was very, very cold. Is that right, Patty? Yeah, very cold. Uh, but in just a couple weeks, our, uh, in just a few weeks, our senior high will go on the same trip. So uh, you can be praying for them as they prepare. Um, also, True City, the registration is open. If you would like to attend the True City conference this year, uh, that's the end of February, February, I think, 22nd and 24th. The registration is open. You can go on truecity.com and, uh, or .ca and sign up for that conference. Um, and then finally, uh, just to remind you or let you know a little more from last week, I mentioned uh, Michael Ladosier had passed away. Mikey's funeral is going to be this Thursday here in our sanctuary at 1 p.m. And uh, I guess to our, for our congregation, I would just encourage you, I, I know many of you probably didn't know Mikey very well, um, other than knowing that he was one of the boys that sat in a wheelchair at the back. But this is an opportunity for us as a church to support his community, the people from the home where he lived, uh, as well, I believe, as his mother is going to be here. Uh, and so this is a chance for some of us to come and to be present and to bear witness to the fact that, that Mikey mattered. He might matter to us, he mattered to Jesus. And so I would encourage you to, if you have time, come uh, Thursday afternoon at 1 o'clock for a, a brief service. On the same note, um, I'm grieving today um, because um, the Reverend Gary Nelson, Reverend Dr. Gary Nelson, passed away this week. And for those of you that have been around the Baptist world a long time, um, Gary from about 2000 to 2010 was the um, executive director of Canadian Baptist Ministries, or as I like to call him during those years, the, our Pope. And uh, Gary was, um, before that, he was a, a pastor of First Baptist Church in Edmonton and a, a good friend and colleague uh, in ministry there when I was serving in Edmonton. And actually, my favorite professor at seminary. And um, his loss, I, I just, I'm really feeling it today. Uh, he was one of those men who early on in my pastoral ministry um, really, really just made me uh, love ministry as a pastor. He was someone that uh, inspired me, and uh, I learned so much about urban ministry and, and, and church uh, development through Gary. And um, I remember as a, as a young youth pastor uh, sitting on a, a national youth pastors committee that he had brought together and he really kind of I think facilitated a whole generational movement among young Baptist leaders uh, to bring uh, new leaders into our, our denomination and uh, uh, his his influence and his smile uh, will always be with me but I'm, I'm grieving that today um, his service is going to be online on Tuesday afternoon at three o'clock if you're interested in watching it you can talk to me and I'll, I'll send you a link for it but um, certainly for us as Canadian Baptists, uh, we want to remember and honor Gary today. With that being said, um, it's time for us to enter into our time of worship. Let me just read to you from Isaiah chapter 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. Let's turn to the Lord now in our time of worship. Please stand, if you're able.
one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere, thousands elsewhere. One thing I ask and I would seek to see your beauty.
morning. You know, I love playing when I play up here with these guys, but I forgot how much I love to sing my praise, too. It's really good. It's, thank you, guys. Um, okay, Ch check it out. What's this? No? I pull it out. Throw it anywhere. Play-Doh. That's right. It's Play-Doh. Kids love Play-Doh. Now, for some reason... My kids never got to play with it. Well, it's because I wouldn't let them. But um, <laughs> for some reason, I, I never liked Play-Doh. And I bought this for today. And my, my granddaughter was over last night. And she insisted on having it out. And I remembered instantly why I don't like it. Because it makes a mess. When you clean it up, and, and she did. She did her, you know, she put it all back in here, gave it to me. And I look on the floor, and there's still crumbs and stuff. My ADD, HD, OD, whatever, can't deal with that. So instead, it just doesn't come into our house, and that's how it was for my kids, and I feel bad for them. My grandkids get to play with it all the time. For some reason, I, I buy it for my grandkids. But this stuff is neat stuff. Because in the carpet bed, so you can make anything you want. Instantly, she got it out. Three years old, she got it out, and she starts rolling it into it. And I thought, you, you've done this before. Now, I was going to stand up here. And do something while I'm telling you that Play-Doh is a lot like life. You can do whatever you want with it. 
you can make whatever you want out of it. You can take your life and do whatever you want. Play-Doh, you can make whatever you want. Now, I was going to try and make a dog, because it's easy, right? A little bit of rolling, you break it in half, there's a couple legs, and then sort of a body and a head on. Should be easy to make a dog. But here's the problem. A lot like life, I, I think I'm pretty talented, but I'm not really that good. And I'll tell you, I'll give you a great example. This year, I was in Dollarama, and I saw, like, clay, modeling clay. My wife collects unicorn, um, seahorses. She loves seahorses, and she's got quite a few. I thought, I'll make her one. She'll love that, and it'll be great. I'll spend some time on it. I'm rel See, you already are laughing, and that's the problem. <laughs> I brought it. Yes, this is what I made for my wife for Christmas. That's pretty good. Now, it's not bad. I got to admit, I, I, okay, that's all right. She loves it because I made it, and so it, it lives on the, somewhere in the house. And, and it's, it's not bad, but I got to tell you, no. It's not good enough. It's, I, I would rate it like maybe grade five, grade four, I don't know. Maybe the, I, a, a true artist, like there's no Kirith Alibi in there, you know? <laughs> Um, so, I want better. I want better. I couldn't do better for her, but if I'm going to mold my life, I want better. So, the thing to have, I wish I had it with this, is a mold. If I had had a mold, I could have done that. Much better than this. I just happen to have a mold with me. A mold of a dog. Oh, it's Snoopy. What do you know? <laughs> so, if I take my mold and I take my silly putty and I start jamming it in here, it's kind of like if I turn my life over to God. And I say, here, you mold me, set me up. He can ram me in and sit here, and he trims away the stuff that doesn't need to be there. And he jams in. I've got to shove a little bit more here and take a little bit off of here and get it in there. A little bit of trimming. And he'll make something out of your life that you want it to be. He'll get, make this mold will be Jesus. He'll make it so other people can look at you and say, that's Jesus. And that's what God wants to do. Ultimately, he wants people to look at you and see Jesus. Now, I'm, oh, maybe it's going to work. Yeah, yeah. Maybe not. Yeah, that's not much better than a seahorse. <laughs> but you get the idea. Let Jesus be the mold for your life and make yourself look more like Jesus. It'll be a lot better. Because it says in the Bible, in all things, God works for good with those who love him. So if we're working with him, then he's going to work for good with us. Sound good? Sounds good. All right. Hello, church. Serger here. Well, let me tell you something. This year, I have the amazing privilege of leading a team of teens and young adults on a compassion experience to Dominican Republic. And that's going to happen on March 9 all the way to the 16th of this year. And you can come alongside and partner up with us by praying and supporting the team with your prayers, but as well by helping us get there with your financial support. Because the idea is for these teens and young adults to come alongside the people in Dominican Republic, teens and kids and young adults in Dominican Republic, and learn from them and work alongside them. They're going to be working in construction. They're going to be uh, uh, doing songs. They're going to be playing with the kids and just, just absorbing the culture and learning from there of how God is working in the Dominican Republic. It's very exciting. You're going you're gonna to hear more about it. So if you want to partner up, here is how. God bless you, and thank you so much. Andy, if you want to know how uh, to partner with the team and to support them, uh, there's a link that was sent to you in your uh, email this week. 
from your Harmony Happenings that went along with that. You can just follow that link and it'll take you right in there. You'll be able to see how the team's doing as far as raising their support. You're going to be able to hear a little bit of their testimony as to what, uh, what God is doing and why they're going. You can also go and look on our bulletin board out here. Just between the, the two bathrooms, there's a bulletin board. It's got all the team members' faces because Jadesco is actually missing from that picture. All their faces are on there along with a little bit about them and why they want to be on the trip. Uh, and I would encourage you and invite you to do that. Um, as we prepare to send this team off to, uh, to partner in Dominican Republic this March. Right now, however, it's time to receive our morning offering. Um, if you are uh, new around here, first of all, you may not be receiving that weekly news, uh, news uh, bulletin from the church. Uh, just talk to me. We can make sure to hook you up so you can get the information each week about what's going on in, our, in the life of our church. But also, uh, you may not be aware that... Uh, you don't have to put something in the offering plate here. Um, many of our members choose to give through pre-authorized giving, and uh, they, they just decide with God how they want to support their church, and they arrange so that it comes out automatically. So if, if you're new around here and you don't notice a lot of people putting things in the plate, it's because they choose to give in a different way. Um, but you also don't have to give at all. We are just happy to have you here. And if you're a guest here this morning, please sit back and just enjoy the music that comes while we receive the offering. Can we just pray before we do so? Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to give and to share and to be a part, even as Dave said, of what you're doing in the world. We want people to see Jesus when they see us. And so receive our tithes and offerings now and use them to accomplish your purposes in our community and around the world. In Jesus' name. At this time, our uh, teens uh, and children can be dismissed to their Sunday school class. It's taking longer and longer for them to get out every week. It's, it's kind of exciting. There's more and more all the time. Friday night I was here and... Uh, 
and watching the youth had uh, their youth event on Friday night, and there was, what, 30 kids here on Friday night, and uh, just having a, a barrel of fun, and it's, it's awesome to see what God's doing uh, in our young people. Just before we open God's Word together, we're going to pray, and we're going to pray extra hard this morning, because I'm going to, uh, <clears throat> I think, uh, offer some theological um, um, points of view this morning that that may leave you raising your eyebrows and saying, I'm not sure if I agree with that. And I'm kind of excited about that and nervous about that at the same time. Uh, so as I share what I have for you today, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't come and share with you every week and say, what I, what I have shared with you, take it to the bank. Everything I say is absolutely true. My point of view is absolutely correct. There are a lot of different theological views. And... Uh, there's going to be pastors that would have a different approach to the passage of Scripture that I'm sharing with you today. And I don't think it's a matter of, hey, my pastor's the right one, my pastor's better than your pastor. We all know I'm better than, you know, most, but I'm better looking than most of the pastors. But no, it's, it's not about you always taking my point of view. What I hope to do every single week is not say, here, you have to sign on to this, what I've just said, but what I hope to have you do is to go home saying, well, that was really interesting. I want to know more about that. I want to study more about that. Or to go home going, I think he was out to lunch, and I'm going to prove him wrong. And either way, you're in your Bible, and we can have further discussion, and I, I'm excited about that. But this morning, as we approach this passage in Romans 8, 12 to 17, um, I'm just going to ask for extra prayer and extra grace from you. Um, so shall we pray together? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to open your word. Sometimes we just take it for granted that we have a love letter from God. The ruler of the, the universe gave us a book that is living and powerful and life-changing. And this is a gift from you that, that is so precious. And often we, we, don't, we don't think of it that way. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for, thank you for speaking to us and into our lives, giving us direction, giving us a mold to fit into. God, as we open your word today, we invite your Holy Spirit to sift through my words and to let the right pieces fall in our hearts that we might leave this place transformed by your word, not by Pastor Eldon's words. God, as we think of um, the church as a whole, our Baptist denomination across the country, um, I think many of us feeling the loss of, of Gary Nelson. And um, Lord, he was, a, he was a giant among us. He was a, a leader and a visionary, and someone that sure knew how to put his arms around people and bring them alongside. And um, God, we just thank you for his example. I pray for his, uh, his dear wife, Carla, who's now been left alone, and for his children. And uh, Lord, I just, I just pray that you would sustain them during this time of grief and help them as they prepare to, uh, to honor his memory on Tuesday. We pray that each one that listens to that service will be inspired to further service and to deeper commitment to you, Jesus. Lord, we also pray for the service that we'll be having here for Mikey, and we just pray that, Lord, you would help us to honor his memory, and that you would help us to show your love and your care to his community. Lord, we commit ourselves at this time to sitting at your feet, to listening to you, and to obeying what it is you say to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, <clears throat> some of you that know me well know that um, I'm a bit of a history nerd. Uh, I, I love history. Uh, but I also... Uh, particularly, really, I'm really fond of 
and you've heard about me talk about this before, about genealogies and family lines and all those kinds of things. One of the aspects of that is the royal family. Not just our royal family. Uh, there are more than one royal family. So not just our royal family in the UK, but um, royal family in, in different places. I have never actually met a royal. Uh, I did see Queen Elizabeth our late queen riding her black horse uh, outside of Buckingham Palace one time as part of the parade. Uh, I did watch uh, Charles and his first wife Diana's wedding. I can still remember watching their wedding. We were camping in just outside North Battleford, Saskatchewan. When my, my parents, were, we, they had to have it on. And, uh, and we watched that wedding. Um, I remember when Princess Diana died. Uh, Princess Diana died the morning that my wife Val came to church with me for the very first time when we were dating. Um, kind of locks that date into my memory. Uh, but I, I, I do follow the royals. I, I am interested in the story. And uh, the only person kind of royal that I ever met, I had dinner at, I was invited for dinner at the house of, I believe he was a count, um, in in. Avignon, France, um, this French count, and uh, I guess that's as close as I got to rubbing shoulders with the elite. He was, uh, uh, it, was, a, it, was a, it was a cool opportunity. Uh, anyway, all that to say, um, the royal family has something to do with what I'm going to be talking about this morning, and I think you're going to get that as I go uh, through this message, but what I want to say is, what must it be like to be a part of the royal family. I mean, I think there's probably some downsides to it. Um, if you talk to Prince Harry, he would probably tell you the downsides of it, but there's probably some privileges as well. And we're going to talk a bit about the royal family uh, in, in a little while. This morning, we're back in Romans chapter 8. Uh, and so in the first 11 verses of Romans 8, Paul has finished his argument about the law, which he began in, in chapter 7. And he laid the foundation for his exposition of the Spirit's work, uh, which continues through the majority of Romans chapter 8. But the central section of this passage is verses 12 to 30. And this morning, we're going to zoom in closely at the, the first half of that chunk, uh, verses 12 to 17. So why don't we read them together this morning? I invite you to turn with me or follow on the screen behind me. Romans chapter 8. And we'll read verses 12 to 17. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. This is the word of the Lord. So here in verse 12... Paul seems to take this deep breath after what he's written uh, in the first part. And, and as he's dictating his letter, takes a breath and he says, Therefore, brothers and sisters. Now, do you remember what we're supposed to do whenever we see the word therefore? What's it there for? Very good. The point is that what follows next is going to build on what he has just written before it. Paul is saying then, based on what I've just told you, here's the point I'm trying to make. Here's, here's what I'm trying to say to you, which is that rooted in Christology, justification leads directly to glorification. That's two big seminary words. And you might be saying, huh, what does that mean? Well, let me just say that the theme of the next few verses are doctrinal things like justification, glorification, the work of the Spirit, a call to holiness. But what I want to suggest to you this morning 
is that the meaning Paul gives to these themes, and this is where you might go, hmm, is subtly different than the way many of us have read them within the North American church. So here's the thing. When Paul, when we're reading what Paul writes, we have to be very careful to see what Paul actually says rather than just seeing what we want him to say. As I said the last two weeks, this whole chapter is, is all about the ultimate Christian hope, the Christian inheritance. But if you ask the average believer what their hope of inheritance is, it's likely they'll say something about going to heaven or waiting for God to call them home or going to be with Jesus way beyond the blue. But let me remind you, Romans 8 never mentions heaven. It never mentions going up into the sky as opposed to the earth. It doesn't mention waiting to be called somewhere else. This chapter is not about escaping this creation to go somewhere else. It's about new creation. I remind us of this because of the many songs that we sing. And even some of the words that I say at a funeral like the one we'll have on Thursday. They're platonic versions of the faith. Verse 22 talks about the whole creation groaning as in the pains of childbirth. The groaning of all creation, I think, is rather obvious and apparent to us all, isn't it? Whether it's climate change or the increasing instability of our political systems and the wars and rumors of wars all over our world, of hatred and strife and polarization, we urgently need to understand the genuine biblical message that helps us to live in the midst of the chaos of these times. And not just to survive these times, but to thrive within them. And so as we begin to carefully examine verses 12 to 17, we need to ask the question that you can ask of virtually every passage of Scripture that Paul writes. You look at the start and the finish, and you ask, how are the two connected? In what way does does verse 17 finish off at least the first part of the train of thought that he begins with in verse 12. So Paul tells us, he begins by telling us that we have an obligation. What's an obligation? It's a debt. We have a debt. Not to the flesh, he says, but then he leaves it hanging. Notice how it's written? Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to live, not to the flesh, to live according to it. He leaves that hanging there. The natural thing would be to say, okay, um, so what is the obligation to then? But he, he doesn't go on to say what the obligation is to. He just leaves that thought marinating. Now, some of us suggested that Paul means that we're indebted to the spirit because he often links or contrasts flesh and spirit like he does in verse 13. So that would make sense. But I don't believe that that is the debt he's referring to. As the paragraph develops and as it reaches its goal, it becomes clear that our debt is to God the Father himself. The theme builds beginning in verse 14. We are God's sons. By the way, ladies, when you hear we are God's sons or when you see the word sonship, don't read that in a, in a gender way. Um, it's not about being God's sons. It's about being his Firstborn, and I'm going to come into that a little bit more later. We've received the spirit of sonship. We cry out to God as Abba, Father. The spirit testifies that we are God's children. And then in verse 17, the conclusion, linking back to verse 12, we are indebted to God. Why? Because we are his heirs. Fellow heirs with the Messiah. God has made a wonderful creation And he's leaving it, he's bequeathing it to his children. Now the promise of resurrection within God's new creation, as set out in verses 9 to 11, brings Paul to make this point. We have been left a glorious legacy, named as God's heirs and co-workers in this new world, sharing in his wise and healing rule. 
Now, normally, you only receive an inheritance after the person who wrote their will dies. Right? If you were given a large portion of someone's estate, they're not around to receive your thanks after the lawyer cuts you the check. But when it's in a matter of inheriting from God himself, we're in a perpetual state of happy indebtedness to him. It's a debt of love that only love can repay. Now here's where you may disagree with me or find my conclusions too exceptional for you. That door is unlocked, right? In case I need to make a quit escape. Within the church, we think mainly of going to heaven eventually. Our body is buried, but our, our soul gets to go be in the presence of God. And we think the only thing that matters is whether or not we've honored God by keeping this moral code as we've lived, and that when we discover that God has saved us, despite our moral failures, because of his grace, we simply learn to live properly as a result in response until we die and our soul can go to be with him. But I would argue... If we adopt Paul's way of thinking here, we must come to a different understanding. The Spirit has already made us new creation people. And we stand in the doorway between this present age and the age to come. And as we do so, we discover our true vocation. My friend, I believe that this is what this whole passage is about. Who we are called to be while we stand in the overlap of two different ages. The start of Paul's answer to that question of who we are called to be is that we are already part of the new creation. <clears throat> We're part of the new creation, which having come to birth with Jesus' resurrection is on the way to the final rescue of the present creation from its slavery to corruption and death. Let me say it another way. By the Spirit, we find ourselves part of the active pilot project for that ultimate new creation. New creation people ourselves and an agent of new creation in the present. Part of our church vision. We're changed people who are changing the world. So we are already called to live gladly and gratefully as God's free children. Think back to Exodus. We have been set free from our Egypt. And we're caught up in the work of God's Spirit who enables us to pray, Abba, Father, even when, like the desert wilderness, the world all around us seems rather dark and desolate. Well, the climax to this is going to come a dozen verses later. But we are in debt to God because being his heirs, we are to live in the present as his sons and daughters. Because of the inheritance we're receiving, it means we need to live differently. The people the world looks at to get an impression of who the Father must be is us. I said I'd refer back to that idea of sonship. When God says, or when, when Paul writes and uses that particular word, sonship, here, he's referring to the idea of, of being the firstborn, of being the one who inherits the firstborn son does not just bring future rights. The, the fact that you will then, you know, rise into your father's place and assume all that he has. But it brings a present responsibility. I think of our own royal family. I would say to you that I think that these two men, William and, and Harry, have different feelings about their family. I would argue that Prince William accepts the responsibility of being the son of the royal family, whereas Harry would prefer not to have the responsibility of that family. 
If you've watched any of the documentaries, you may feel compassion for one or the other. All we know is there's friction between these two men. But I, 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 pr I present this as an example because I believe that we are all called to be like Prince William, taking on the responsibility of what it means to be a son of the royal family. I believe that Paul expands on what it means to be God's inheriting children, how to be faithful to that responsibility. Well, we'll look at that passage next week in verses 18 to 30. I think it gives the detail of how exactly you do that. But the heart of the passage we're looking at today, the heart of this little passage is that our present vocation as God's children and heirs, our present lives are to be lived as the people in whom God's Spirit, bearing witness with our own spirit, prays the very prayer that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Abba, Father. And in verse 17, he builds to his conclusion by saying, well, then if that is true, then this also is true. If we are his children, we are heirs. And that is why we are debtors, not in the sense of owing God an uncomfortable obedience the way we owe our mortgage money to the bank, but rather in the sense of discovering our true vocation as God's agents of change now. We represent the royal family. We're his prayerful stewards, his appointed heirs. Within the groaning of the old creation, we witness to the promise of the new creation. So let me move on to the third vital question that we need to ask whenever we read Paul. Can we learn anything by standing in his first century sandals? So I want you to imagine that you're, you're sitting not in our church, but in one of the first century Roman house churches, and you're listening to someone read this letter to you from Paul for the first time. What would you be thinking in response to what you hear? Well, in the Roman world of that day, Inheriting an empire was a well-known theme. A hundred years before this was written, Julius Caesar had adopted Octavian, who was subsequently uh, known as Augustus Caesar. After Julius died and was deified, Caesar Augustus was known as the son of the deified Julius. He was the adopted son and inherited the empire along with being loyal to the memory of Julius Caesar himself. And, and so it continued with Tiberius and Caligula and Claudius and Nero. None of them were related as father to son. They were chosen and adopted and groomed for the job. As their future heir had certain rights, they had certain rights and responsibilities. And when the old emperor died and was deified, the adopted son would become the son of the deified one, inheriting the empire. Okay, just as an aside, again, this comes from the history nerd of me. If you want to see a really cool website or watch some really cool videos, you can go on uh, YouTube, for instance, just type Royalty Now Project. And if you go on there, there's an artist who's been using um, uh, uh, her, like using the techniques we have now with photo restoration and everything, to take these ancient statues like this one on the picture behind me and, and recoloring it, repainting it, to, to what would this person look like if they were alive now? It's really, really cool. Just a little aside for you, if you're into history the way I am, royalty now, um, and you can see everyone from Louis XIV to what, it's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. Has nothing to do with my sermon, but this is really cool. <laughs> All right, so what Paul is claiming here, just as he did at the start of Romans, is that Jesus is the true son of the true God. He's the divine one, the only divine one. And that all Jesus' people, all, all followers of Jesus, the, the church, share the standing of sonship. The church is God's adopted royal family. And so these people, these people who, 
who, who know about this practice, they know how the emperor adopts the son who will then take over, they hear this and they realize Paul is talking about them. They are that adopted son who's going to take over the empire that's going to take on all the privileges and responsibilities that come with it. And this is key, hear this. We are God's children and heirs, not just so that we can feel good about our relationship to the Father, but so that we can carry out our Father's project and to rule wisely over our Father's empire, which is the whole created world. If you look back at Romans 5.17, those who accept God's gift will reign in life. It's a counter-imperial claim. We've been set in authority over God's world. The vocation of the people of Israel had been to be a royal priesthood. And that is now supremely fulfilled in Israel's representative, Jesus, the Messiah. And it's now shared by the Spirit with all his people. Jews and Gentiles alike. This is central to all that Paul is saying. This is the fleshing out of the vocation to be God's image bearers. You and I were designed, we were created, and we were called to reflect the praises of all creation back to God and to reflect God's wise rule into the world. As I read this, the Exodus narrative is so clearly visible, especially in verse 15 where Paul contrasts sonship and slavery. He says, you were slaves, now you're sons. So don't even think about going back to slavery. You don't want to go back to Egypt. Didn't Keith Green sing about that? Pretty sure that was a Keith Green song. Anyway, verse 16 provides the assurance through the indwelling Holy Spirit, that we are God's children. This is extending God's original promise that he made to Abraham to all believers, even to Gentiles. Paul addresses that a little bit more later in the book of Romans, in chapters 14 and 15, but it's clear here that he's talking to all Messiah's people, not just the Jews. He's talking to all Jesus' followers. And once we see this, verse 17 turns us in an unexpected direction. If we are heirs... If we are co-heirs with Jesus, the implication might be that we will rule by defeating God's enemies. You know, like, like riding our chariots into mighty military conquest. It's, it's easy for us to read uh, <clears throat> Psalm 2 and to see Psalm 2 lying beneath the surface of verse 17. In Psalm 2, God says to the king, Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the world for your possession. But here's the thing. Worldwide conquest is not the way of the Messiah. It's not the way the Messiah inherited the world. The glory of worldwide rule would only come through the hard road of suffering. Which is why he cried out that last terrible night in the garden. When Jesus was wrestling with his vocation, he cries out to Abba Father as his whole self recoils from the idea that the way to the kingdom lay only through the cross. And I believe all of this helps us to understand verses 12 and 13 where Paul makes it clear that the road to life is the road of actively putting to death the things that the body would otherwise want to do. These were the very things that the Jesus was tested on by the devil in the wilderness. This is what we can do as his followers to make his kingship a reality in the present and in the future. We've been called to share our Savior's cross-shaped path to his kingly rule over the world. Let me close with this. This whole passage really talks about holiness and hope. Holiness means drawing down from God's promised future, the life we're to live in the present. We ourselves are to be places where heaven and earth come together, which means that as we pray for God's rule to become a reality on earth as it is in heaven, we must daily to seek to live out that reality in our own bodies. Holy living is important not because God doesn't want us to have any fun, 
but because we're called to be fully human in a way that most of us have scarcely even begun to imagine. If you want homework this week, read Galatians chapter 5 or Colossians chapter 3 or 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and you'll see that we're not to live according to the normal human fleshly desires, but with a new kingdom mindset. To put it another way, we don't live like the peasants anymore because we have been adopted into the royal family. Real life means bringing the life of heaven to birth in a new earthly lifestyle. It can be spontaneous and authentic, but that will only happen by denying what comes naturally and choosing to live by the Spirit. To repeat, it can only happen by the Spirit. Life in the Spirit is the only way to please God. The Holy Spirit doesn't just guarantee our ultimate future. The Holy Spirit brings that ultimate future into our present everyday experience. My friends, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we belong to God. That we're part of the family. What is the Spirit saying to you? Do you have that peace and assurance that you are part of God's royal family? If you don't, you can. I invite you to pray with me now as we close. Heavenly Father, In your goodness and grace, you have called us to be your sons and daughters. You've invited us to become a part of your royal family. And God, for some of us, we've had our hands up saying, I don't need that. I'm good on my own. But God, if we're honest, we, we know that's not true. There's an emptiness, a loneliness, a quiet desperation in us that longs to be a part of something that matters, longs to, to be known by a name greater than our own. And so God, this morning, by your spirit, give us the assurance we seek. Once again, we open our hearts and lives to you. We invite you, Heavenly Father, to be our Father. And God, we commit ourselves once again to representing the family well. God, we know that we're not perfect. We know that we're going to th do things that cause shame for the family. But God, we are assured of your love and forgiveness. And so God, this morning, we thank you for that. We thank you for the privilege and the honor of being called by your name. So be with us as we go into this week. Help us to lift our heads, throw back our shoulders, and to walk with the grace of a royal heir. We are yours. Until you come again, we are yours. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Stand for our final hymn.
great hymn of response. Uh, what a perfect way to capture our attitude in response to that word of scripture. Listen, as we close our service, don't go out into this week and live like people who are waiting for the king to die so that you can get what's coming to you. Instead, embrace what it means to be part of the family now. Represent your father. You get it in a human sense, right? Those of you that are older and, and going, my kids are someday going to fight over my inheritance. You want the relationship with them now, right? You don't want them just to be waiting for you to die so that someday they can get what's coming to them. God's saying the same thing to you. Don't let your thoughts and your mind be all about heaven someday. Instead, fill your thoughts and your time with life spent with the king now. You've been given access to the throne. And God, the Father, the ruler of the universe, desires a relationship with you, brings things into your life to mentor and shape you. What an awesome privilege it is to be children of the king. Go into your week and live that way. Amen.